Okay, shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time that we can come together and worship and hear your word. Father, I just ask for, for your wisdom as I speak, and I ask, Lord, that we have our minds open and our hearts open to your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, so today's sermon deals with how Christians are to relate to the government. And of course, that includes politics. So, as many of you may know, um, the Democrat Party just uh, had their convention this week, and I don't know if many of you stayed up late to watch that. Um, I didn't, but, but anyway. Um, so anyway, considering the upcoming election, I think that the timing of this sermon is quite good. Um, I don't plan on discussing any political issues, and I don't plan on giving any advice on how to vote, but I would like to say one thing. Now, you probably all heard the expressions of uh, right wing and left wing, and you, you know what they mean, you know, the, the, the right wing is typically the conservatives um, in America, that would include the Republican Party, and the left wing is typically the liberals, and that would include the Democrat Party. Um, as I was studying for this uh, sermon, I came across this verse, which uh, I think may be of value to you in, in determining um, how you choose to vote. Um, it's from Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 2. A wise man's heart directs him toward the right, but the foolish man's heart directs him to the left. Hopefully you will find that helpful in your politics. Um, today's passage flows naturally from chapter 12, which Pastor Untun covered over the past three weeks. And as we begin in chapter 13, remember that chapter divisions are not part of the inspired, infallible text of Scripture. They were added hundreds of years after the Bible was written. They're useful for navigating Scripture so we can quickly find certain passages and quotations, but unfortunately, sometimes readers uh, think that they indicate a break in thought or subject, and this is not always true. So we should read chapter 13 as though there were no chapter division. For example, going back to chapter 12, verse 16, it says, do not be wise in your own estimation. That's good advice for anyone involved in politics, right? And then verse 17, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. And then verse 18, if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. All this relates to the way Christians should deal with politics, right? And then it says, never take your own revenge, beloved. And then you get down to verse 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So then with all those things in place, now Paul moves into the realm of government. So you have probably noticed that this passage talks about uh, government, but politics is never mentioned. Government and politics are closely related, and it's important to understand the definition of politics. So according to the Merriam-Webster Online Dictionary, government is the organization, machinery, or agency through which a political unit exercises authority and performs functions, and which is usually classified according to the distribution of power within it. That would include all the agencies and departments of government and so on. Politics, on the other hand, is the art and science concerned with winning and holding control over a government. So you can see how government is where authority is exercised and politics is how authority is obtained. So I hear many people claim that this is the most important election in our lifetimes because our nation is so terribly divided, more than at any time since the Civil War 164 years ago. 
So before I get into the meat of today's passage, let me give a little historical perspective on this division. American politics are based on a two-party system. And this is not according to the law. It's not by design. It's simply evolved that way. And it hasn't been that long ago, it hasn't been that long ago that there was a great deal of overlap between these two parties regarding policies and political philosophy. Both parties appealed to Christians and promoted laws which strengthened Christian ideals in our society. Democrats tended to be somewhat more liberal than Republicans, but the overlap was such that there were actually certain Democrats that were more conservative than Republicans, and there were certain Republicans who favored policies which were more liberal than Democrats. Because of this overlap, as you see on, on the screen, uh, it was not unusual for Democrats and Republicans to, to conference together and negotiate laws that would be in the best interests of all Americans. Well, over the past 30 years or so, all of this has changed, and Democrats have shifted entirely to the political left, and Republicans have shifted entirely to the political right. There's no overlap anymore. Since there's no overlap, there's no dialogue, no debate, and no agreement on any issues. So in the current political environment, each side claims that the other side is out to destroy American democracy. Both sides are engaging in violent political rhetoric, which is becoming very dangerous. And this is why our passage today is so important. As we've said before, Paul wrote this letter to the Roman church around 57 AD. Nero was still in power, uh, but the persecution of Christians had not yet reached its peak. Soon, Nero would be putting Christians in the arena to be torn to pieces by lions. The apostles Peter and Paul would be executed around 64 AD after the great fire consumed much of Rome. Clearly, the system of government was greatly different than the one we live under today. Nevertheless, Paul's words in chapter 13 apply to any government at any time in history. Kingdoms, empires, dictatorships, communism, fascism, as well as democracies. As a follower of Jesus, you and I are citizens of two kingdoms, citizens of the kingdom of heaven and citizens of an earthly kingdom or nation. Some of you may have dual citizenship in two earthly kingdoms or nations. Dual citizenship, by its very definition, has an inherent question. To which government do you give your primary allegiance? For Christians, the answer should be obvious. The kingdom of God, right? As I said, we are in the middle of election season in America. In November, we will vote for who will lead our nation for the next four years. Because of the great political division I described, the campaigning can get pretty nasty, as you've noticed. And sometimes even good Christians get swept up in the divisive rhetoric. Living as citizens of two kingdoms is not easy. Living a Christian life in a sin-filled world can be compared with pigs living in mud. It's impossible not to get dirty. Sin, like dirt, gets all over each of us. When the people of God get heavily involved in the political process, it's like wrestling pigs in the mud. We get dirty. Our ethics, our values become dirty, like the ethics of the earthly kingdom, which are the opposite of the ethics of the kingdom of God. So on which kingdom are we focused? Which kingdom have we aligned our hearts to? To which kingdom do our words and activities reflect? Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm, I'm not saying that we should not engage in political debate, but we need to exercise the spiritual fruit of self-control. We need to understand that good people, even Christians, can disagree politically. 
our relationships with friends and family are so much more valuable than making political points. And even more important, the divisive nature of American politics can be the worst thing for the gospel of Jesus Christ and our world. It works in such a way to force the church to be a pawn in the political battles. And when the church allows itself to be a pawn, rather than realizing that we're playing a whole different game, the church stops being salt. It stops being light. And the gospel cannot be heard. Our goal should be that our allegiance is to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It should be our only goal. Christians cannot allow themselves to be political pawns. We are so much more than that. We are representatives of the Lord Most High. So with all that being said, I want us to engage in a little activity. We're going to do things a little differently today. So I want you to all stand up. I got this little exercise from a pastor I heard on YouTube, and I thought it was so impressive, I, I, would, I would borrow it in this sermon. So I want you to look at the person nearest to you, and I want you to repeat after me, I love you. <laughs> because Jesus loves you. And even if we disagree about politics, I still love you. Because Jesus is better than politics. Amen. Now let's see what Paul has to say about how Christians should live under their government. Chapter 13, verse 1. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And those which exist are established by God. And then verse 2. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. And they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. One of God's attributes is order. You see order in creation. The stars, planets, solar system, all working in perfect order. The absence of order is chaos. Chaos results when God's, creator, when God's created order is compromised. Before sin entered the world, God gave what we call the cultural mandate in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God filled the earth, organized it, gave purpose to every created thing, and then gave dominion to man. Governments honor God's created order when they establish laws and seek justice, even when they don't do it perfectly. Anarchy, in the other, on the other hand, is chaos or disorder and threatening God's created order. Therefore, governments serve the purpose of God, whether they know it or not. Our understanding of human governments must be understood in the context of God's authority. Therefore, because God grants authority, every person must be subject to that authority. So let's summarize what we've learned so far. One, God favors order, not anarchy. We've been placed under governing authorities. The authority of the government has been granted by God. And we, when we resist the government, we are in opposition to God and are subject to condemnation. Remember that these principles apply no matter what form the governing authorities take. This does not just apply to democracies. In fact, these principles apply to every human institution, the family, the workplace, the church, and so on. So 
As I was reading through this, my first, the first question that comes to my mind, maybe you too, what about tyrannical governments? For example, were the American colonies disobeying God when they rebelled against the King of England? Was Indonesia rebelling against God when they rebelled against the Dutch colonial government? This is a very important point, so listen carefully. When authority has been granted by God, it is never given so that the one in authority can act selfishly or bring harm in any way upon those subject to him. God does not give authority for oppression. God gives authority for protection and flourishing. And the best example of this is the ultimate authority, Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. What did Jesus do? He laid down his life for us. The ultimate king sacrificed himself for the benefit of the people who are subject to him. So the problem is not with authority in and of itself. The problem is with the way that power or authority is exercised. Does that make sense? So what Paul is saying here is that God gives authority to government and as believers, our job is to live in submission. It doesn't matter if you disagree with certain laws. The government made the laws, and so we have to live in subjection to those laws. When you resist the authority that is God-given, ultimately you get yourself into trouble, resulting in fines, jail time, or maybe even worse. Paul is encouraging us to be law-abiding citizens. Now, Paul does not give us any exceptions here. However, it doesn't take long, paging through the, the scripture, which is filled with examples of civil disobedience. When the people of God are forced to decide between being obedient to the governing authorities or to God. In these situations, even though we must follow God, disobeying the government authorities can carry heavy consequences. For example, Peter and John, in Acts chapter 4, verse 19 to 20, Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge, for we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. And then in Exodus chapter 1, verse 17, Pharaoh commanded the Hebrew midwives to kill male newborns. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt had commanded, but they let the boys live. And then in Daniel chapter 3, when the order was given to worship the golden image, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused and were cast into the fiery furnace. And then in Daniel chapter 6, Daniel was thrown into the lion's den when he refused to stop praying. So, Laws made by the government fall into two categories for Christians. Those that do not violate God's law and those that do. So if the laws do not violate God's law, we are to obey them, even if we don't agree with them. Our job is to submit as unto the Lord, knowing that any resistance to that authority is going to bring judgment. And God doesn't want us to come into judgment. But when the government enacts laws that force you to do something that violates God's word, then civil disobedience is the proper response. These verses become challenging when the government does not seek to reward good and to suppress evil. And we've seen all sorts of data over thousands of years of human history to be able to see that there are times when the government is the problem. In fact, President Ronald Reagan, in his inaugural address in 1981, said, in this present crisis, the government is not the solution to the problem. Government is the problem. Think of someone like the German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was executed in a Nazi prison because he was involved in a plot to assassinate Adolf Hitler. The Nazi government under Adolf Hitler was behind one of the greatest genocides in human history. And in those extreme situations, the people of God have had to take up some extreme measures. In the midst of a government that is hell-bent on evil, 
than the people of God because we answer to a higher authority need to resist that evil. Edmund Burke is quoted as saying, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Martin Niemöller, a Christian pastor imprisoned by the Nazi regime, famously said, first they came for the communists and I did not speak out because I was not a communist. Then they came for the socialists and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me and there was no one left to speak for me. Let's go on the next couple of verses. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger, who brings wrath to the one who practices evil. Notice what it says in verse 3. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. The idea is that a good government that understands its authority is a threat to people who want to do wrong. Titus chapter 3, verse 1 and 2 says, Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one. To be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. Paul, in writing to Titus, puts together the idea of being submissive, submissive to the rulers and authorities over us and to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all people. Wouldn't it be wonderful if American politics worked like that? What does it say? Speak evil of what? Of no one. How should we be? Peaceable, gentle, humble. Now it's not so mad, it's, it's not so bad if, if your man or woman is in the White House. The challenge is when you don't agree with a person in office. That's when we show what's really in our hearts. If you are aligned to the politics of this worldly kingdom, you're going to exhibit the ethics of this worldly kingdom. But if you're a follower of Jesus, God has a more excellent way. You have to ask yourself right now, do I speak evil of people? If you do, stop it and repent. Are you peaceable? Are you a proactive proponent of peace? Are you gentle? If not, stop it and repent? Are you wise in your own opinion? If you are, stop it and repent. Be humble. Again, look at what it says from the middle of verse, verse 3. Oops. It says, do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good and you will have praise from the same, for it is a minister of God. Now that word that is translated minister is diakonos. It's the same word as a deacon, which means servant. So the minister is a servant of the people. The concept of public servant didn't come about in our age. It came about 2,000 years ago. God uses government. Verse 4 says that these authorities are God's servants to you for good. The idea is that God leverages government to be able to serve humanity. In the ideal situation, the ruler sees himself in his position of power and understands that he's been granted authority by God and says, I want to use that authority which has been God-given to serve the people for good and to protect them from evil. That should be the thoughts of the leader. Now, I've heard it said that God created government, but people 
created politics. Think about that for a moment. God has always leveraged government in some ways, and we see that over and over in the Bible. But the struggle or competition for power, which is politics, always seems to be motivated by people and their selfish agendas. As a follower of Jesus, you should be informed on the issues and candidates and then go and vote. That's a gift that you've been given. Unlike so many throughout history, we get to elect our officials. That's an awesome privilege and we should all take that opportunity to be involved. When the people of Israel were exiled to Babylon, the prophet Jeremiah spoke these words from the Lord. Jeremiah 29, 7, Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will have welfare. The people of Israel were to participate in the culture of the nation in which they were exiled, and they were to pray to the Lord for its welfare. Although they could not vote for their government, they could live in peace, even in that pagan culture, as long as the nation was at peace. Listen to what Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may, meet, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. How should we deal with our elected officials? We pray for them. Prayers of intercession and the giving of thanks. It doesn't say if you agree with them. It doesn't say if you like them. It doesn't say if you like their background or their views on this issue or that issue. It's the same for all. Why? What's the goal of the person whose authority is the eternal kingdom, the kingdom where Jesus is king, king of kings and lord of lords? Listen to what it says, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. Our goal as believers is that the government does not interfere in our desire to lead peaceful and quiet lives of godliness and holiness. So it doesn't matter if you agree with the elected official or not. Our goal is the same. But then it tells our real goal. Listen again to what it says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. What is the ultimate goal of the child of God? to see people come to know Jesus. Remember how I said earlier that the political parties are so divided that there's no dialogue between them? When we think that Jesus aligns himself with one of the political parties, then the people in the other political party say, I don't want to know Jesus. Why would I want to know Jesus? Because Jesus is like those people. And what does verse 4 say? God wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. He isn't content with 50% of the population. And as Christians, we shouldn't be either. Why would you want to limit the scope of God's great news, the gospel? Why would we, in the name of a political issue or a political party, limit the scope of what God wants to do? If all your friends believe and vote just the way you do, you're not on mission with Jesus. Jesus didn't come just to save the people who are exactly like you. Jesus came to save all people. Nobody's mistakes are too far from the grace of God. Now, social media has a great capacity for good, for spreading the gospel and sharing the love of Christ. But sometimes we get so involved in social media that we sometimes get carried away. If most of your social media posts are political and they're divisive, then guess what? 
you're part of the problem and you need to stop being part of the problem. I'm saying this to myself as well as to you. The Holy Spirit has convicted me while I prepared this sermon that I should spend more time praying for the people who don't agree with me, interceding for them, and giving thanks for them. Our evangelistic efforts need to be focused on Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for us rather than on divisive political rhetoric. If all of us did that, we'd be in a much better place. Okay. I see some of you starting to fall asleep, so time for another exercise. Get up. Get up. And this time, turn to a different person and say, I love you. Because Jesus loves you. And even if we disagree about politics, I still love you. Because Jesus is better than politics. Amen. <laughs> okay, now let's take a look at what it says in chapters or in verses five to seven. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection not only because of wrath, but also for conscience' sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due them, tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, and honor to whom honor. As it relates to politics, brothers and sisters, you and I need to live honorably. God wants us to live in a way that is honorable to God, honorable to our allegiance to the greater kingdom, to the kingdom of heaven, of which we are made citizens by the finished work of Jesus. When we resist the government, we come in contact, conflict with the laws of the government. Then you get the judgment of the government. For example, if you dishonor the speed limit and drive any way you like, then you end up getting a ticket. That's the wrath of government. If you do something worse, like stealing, then you get more severe wrath. But in these cases, you know you've done wrong. Your conscience produces within you the personal pain of knowing you've done something wrong. What Paul is saying here is that there's something internal in the heart of a person created in the image and likeness of God that when we resist the government, it creates a question of conscience for each of us. Then Paul explains to us that we should render to all their due. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 22? Well, I don't have, this thing's not working. Anyway, Jesus held up, or Jesus had them hold up a coin. And he said, render under Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Taxes are the domain of the earthly kingdom. They are due to Caesar. But people bear the image of God. They are the domain of the heavenly kingdom. They belong to God. Now, I understand how burdensome taxes are. But remember, taxes not only pay for our national defense and security, but also for services that we all use, such as roads, highways, clean drinking water, disaster-related services, education for our children. Now, personally, I'm very grateful that there's roads. I've been in parts of Indonesia, maybe you have too, where the roads are not so good. I mean, you, can't, you can't drive as fast as you want, otherwise you're going to tear your car up. Here we generally have good roads, except toward downtown Houston. They get pretty, pretty dicey. But... Um, Paul is saying that we should render to everyone what's their due. Taxes to whom taxes are due. Customs to whom customs are due. Fear to whom fear is due. And by doing these things, we're honoring the authority and thereby giving honor to whom honor is due. So let's take a look at what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 3. 
Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God, that by doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Now we work in the midst of a world full of government and politics, knowing that God gives authority and that God uses government as a tool to further along God's plan. We choose to live honorably within it as servants of Jesus. But notice it says, at the end of this, it says, honor who? Well, I have a highlight there that doesn't show up very well. Um, it says, honor all people. Love the people of God in a unique way because they're your family of faith. And fear God. Why? Because fearing the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and God is the ultimate authority. Finally, honor the king. In Paul's time, it was a king, but today we have elected officials whom we are to honor, even if we don't agree with them. Okay? Last time, I promise, time for another exercise. Get up. And this time, I want you to look across the room at someone not even close to you. Repeat after me and say, I love you. Because Jesus loves you. And even if we disagree about politics, I still love you. Because Jesus is better than politics. Amen. So here's how I want to encourage you in your politics. We all hold our politics personally and passionately, right? You want to have a politics of honor in your heart. You want to honor all people. If someone doesn't agree with you, you can discuss your differences in an honoring way. That's a lost art. You could say, I don't know if I agree with you, but can you explain? Tell me about this, and how does that work? Instead of resorting to name calling and outrageous accusations, when you honor all people, you say, okay, I don't know that I agree, but let's talk about that, right? And then when someone gets, starts getting all worked up, show them honor by quietly listening to all that they have to say without interrupting. After all, we both have brains and they kind of work most of the time, right? So remember this, everyone votes for what they value and you vote for candidates who share your values. If your values are driven from your Christian beliefs, great. If your values are driven by your non-Christian secular beliefs, you get the same vote as everybody else. God is at work, no matter which way you vote, God is at work using the government of the United States to perform his will. Each one of us has an equal part to play in the election of officials. Each person gets a vote. And as Christians, we're invited to participate with God as he leverages government for our good. We should do that as an act of worship under God. To summarize, we as Christians need to be involved politically, but we must never lose sight of our true goal to see people come to know Jesus. And to do this, our political discussions need to not be divisive, but rather need to reflect God's grace. This presents us with an opportunity to, to share our Christian values with those we engage in political debates. But don't be surprised if the other person that you're debating with is also a Christian and holds a different political perspective. 
When this happens, listen to your brother or sister in Christ and try to understand their perspective. You may not be convinced, but at least you can agree to disagree and walk away as friends. I don't know if you've, if you've ever seen the movie To Kill a Mockingbird, starring Gregory Peck. It was a classic back in the day. Uh, it was based on a novel written by Harper Lee. And in that, there was a quote. The, the um, star of the show there, Gregory Peck, played the part of a, of a lawyer named Atticus Finch. He was defending a, a black man who was accused of rape. And he was trying to explain what was going on to his children. And he said, you never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view, until you climb into his skin and walk around in it. I believe much of our political division could be corrected if only Atticus's advice could be heeded. There is so much prejudice, so much pride, so much caricature, so much tribalism, aloofness, so much unwarranted enmity and distance. And none of us are totally above this. So we must seek to listen patiently and really hear what the other side is saying. It's a mark of intellectual maturity to lower our guard and sympathetically consider how another person's position makes sense to them. Healthy, God-honoring disagreement, however vigorous, cannot bypass this initial step. And so, brothers and sisters, let's not fight about politics, but let's engage in honest, God-honoring debate. I truly believe that unless we, the people of God, who are citizens of a greater kingdom than the temporal kingdoms of, of this world, unless we raise the honorability of the discussion, it's only going to get worse. Why? Because we live in a day and age where the ethics of the earthly kingdoms of this world have no understanding of peace because they don't know the prince of peace. They have no understanding of gentleness because they don't know the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. As long as we, the people of God, are doing politics with the ethics of an earthly kingdom, we completely lose the ability to spread the gospel in our community. If you love Jesus, you have to realize that Jesus loves the people that voted opposite you. Jesus forgives sins of anyone who believes, including the very people who you are criticizing in social media. You're actually driving them away from Jesus rather than being the avenue by which they hear the good news. So brothers and sisters, listen, since we hold our primary allegiance to the kingdom of God, our politics is Jesus. Our allegiance is to the greater kingdom because our allegiance is to the kingdom of heaven that is eternal with the king of kings and the lord of lords to whom every ruler and every authority will ultimately bow the knee. Then you and I, as people of God, are going to walk through a divisively political world in the fruit of the Spirit because the Spirit is driving us with love and with joy and with peace and with patience and with kindness, and with goodness, and with gentleness, and with faithfulness. And what is that last very vital point? Self-control. And against such, the Bible says, there is no law. We have no control over anybody else. You are responsible for you, and I am responsible for me. I desire for us not to pull away from politics, but to engage it, but engage it as salt and light. And I believe that by the power of the Spirit, the Word of God has given us all that we need to accomplish that. So let's walk in that, shall we? Let's pray together. 
Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for the reminder that we are first and foremost citizens of your kingdom. And even though we need to be involved in the affairs of our earthly kingdom, our primary allegiance belongs to you. Forgive us if we become less than gracious when we engage in political discussions and help us to always remember that our true goal is to help people come to know Jesus. Protect and guide us, Lord, in these divisive times in which we live. May our lives be the way we engage, may our lives and the way we engage in politics bring honor and glory to your name. Amen.